We're going to pick it up in verse number 16. The Bible says, All Scripture given by inspiration of God. Now watch. It's profitable. That means it's worth something, right? doesn't take much uh, to figure that word out. For doctrine, that's uh, what's right. That gives you the principles with which to operate out of. Reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, which is what we covered the other day on uh, Wednesday night. We covered instruction and righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished. That comes from the word through. It means through and through, from start to finish, from beginning to end, from alpha to omega, until it's completed. It doesn't mean that you're perfect the second you hear it. It means if you continue to apply it, it will make you reach the goal of striving to be perfect. Never being perfect. There was one perfect. None of the others will ever be. We're supposed to be conformed to His image. We understand that. But clearly understand when we talk about this, throughly means through and through. It means that if I apply the things doctrinally, if I apply the things reproof, I correction, the instruction and righteousness, if I apply those things the correct way, then what it does is, is it furnishes me with what I need to be like Christ. That means the reason that you come to church is not just because you're coming to get uh, some psychological boost to make yourself feel good. You're coming to church to find out how I can be better. Doesn't mean you're bad where you are. Hey there, how are you? I didn't know you were coming today with the little one. Brand new church member. Congratulations. We'll ooh and all later. And we, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take away from you. Please forgive me. We want to spread the love equally. And we have a baby dedication today also. So anyway, so here's, here's what I want you to understand. None of us ever reach that pharisaical high where we get this thought or idea that we could ever be perfect. It's always that when we reflect or look at what the Bible says, it's where can I improve? Where can I do better? Be careful now because the Apostle Paul warns the Corinthian church, the carnal church, he warns them and he says, comparing yourselves by yourselves and measuring yourselves among yourselves is not wise, means you're foolish to think that just because you're better than somebody else, that that means you've reached the standard. The gold standard is to be like him. That happens at death or rapture. Until then, there should be a constant striving to improve your fellowship with Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to cover a couple of verses here after we talk about this instruction and in righteousness so that you might get a better perspective. If you work on your fellowship with the Lord, the Bible said, How shall two walk together except they be agreed? 1 John 1, 9, or 1 John 1, 7 says, If you walk in the light as He is in the light, you have fellowship the one with the other. If you work on that, the rest of it will take care of itself. So what I'm an advocate of is, is you work on how is your relationship with the Lord, because if your relationship with the Lord is how it ought to be, then you will most likely have the conformity on the outside. Where the mistake gets made is that people go ahead and pick out what's would call the law or the legalistic way of doing things and say, if I do this and 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 this, and this let's simplify it. If I'm in fellowship with the Lord, I'm probably getting those things the way they need to be. Understand this also, every one of us is at different levels. Nobody in here is at the same level. God's working on each one of us for certain idiosyncrasies that we all have. Every one of us have things that God knows about that no one else knows about. And some things that God knows about, He's yet to tell us about. I mean, some of the things he's revealed to me during this past year, I'm glad he didn't tell me a few years ago. I would just thought, well, I just need to go ahead and check into the nut house because I, I couldn't have handled. But now I recognize that there's some other things I need to work on. What a great thing to think about. I'm a work in progress. You know what it does? It gives me a reason to keep coming. What a drag to know I've already been in the class and I've already graduated and I've already got everything done. Well, then what's the point of being here in the first place? It's to get better. Let's look at this thing about, uh, about when it comes to being perfect. Look in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. You're going to see a pattern that will develop, I think. And in that pattern, when this man comes along, he comes along by doing the things that are pleasing to God. Is prayer pleasing to God? Yes. Should I work on my prayer life? Yes. Should I do it as a matter of a religious standard? No. no. 
because then it just becomes a religious standard and I'm just doing it because it's a practice. It's not something that is heartfelt or genuine. So you remember the fellow in Luke chapter 9 that he comes over and he goes, I thank God I'm not like that publican. I pray, I fast three times a week and I give and so on and so forth. So prayer becomes a ritual. So you walk in and you maybe cross yourself or you walk in and you light a candle and you fold your hands or you get your fingers just where they're supposed to be. You bow your head and you take a position of prayer, but there's no heart in that. Prayer is something that means there's communication lines that are open. Why'd you bring up prayer? Well, if you're married, you know what happens whenever there's discord in the household, the communication stops. One or the other of you, if not both of you, you stop talking, right? One of the ways to know that you're in fellowship with the Lord is you can still talk to Him about the most minuscule of things. I mean, I'm, I know that you're going to think this is silly. I've used the illustration before, but especially if it has to do with me in a car or something like that, if I get underneath that car and it's 9 sixteenths or metric or whatever it may be, even if I got the right wrench, I pray before I go to crack that nut off of that bolt. You say, why? Because I'm liable to crack more than that nut off of that bolt. <laughs> When that thing slips and my knuckles scrape across the bottom of the oil pan or whatever it might be. Now, I know you guys, y'all are all, you know, mechanically inclined and things like that. And maybe me and tools don't get along as good as some of the rest of you do. But you say, well, preacher, you pray about that? Yeah, if I got one I can't bust loose, I pray and say, Lord, could you help me? And then it breaks. So you say, well, it's because you kept tension on it. Well, you believe whatever you want to. For me, God is a God of answering prayer of the most minute of things. Yes. I come to a stop sign and I'm thinking, Lord, should I go this way or should I go that way? You say, you don't. Surely you ask GPS. No, I, no, I don't. I don't care what she's saying, the, the Joan thing in the car, you know, and recalculating, recalculating, recalculate. And go 300 yards and make a U-turn, you know, and it, it, I, I, I say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Now, that's important. You say, what does it do? It keeps a line of communication open. Right? So that way, when I'm starting to do something that is questionable, when the line of communication is open, he is very quick to step in and say, hey, and give me the warning with words. It's not, hey, I'm getting on to you for even thinking about doing it. It's like, hey, listen, the Lord says to you, don't go that way. Okay, then what do I need to do? Turn around and go the other way. You're headed in the wrong direction. Do you understand? So what I'm an advocate of is, is trying to show you that if you apply the principles in the Bible, it creates, it produces the fruit of that is the relationship between you and Him is consummated in that sense of the word so that you're able to have that kind of a relationship. You don't have to worry about the legalistic things that you need to do. Whether you should or shouldn't do something becomes a matter with, without any problem whatsoever. And here's the great thing. After you get to know him for a while, there's a lot of things that you know without even having to ask. So I've been married a long time. We did 40 years. Yesterday was our anniversary. So we've been together for 40 years, which is a long time. But there are certain things that I know about her and that she knows about me that we can communicate without opening our mouth. Sometimes you can just tell by looking. Sometimes you just know by knowing. She ain't going to like that or she'll like that. You can walk through a store and then she wouldn't like that, you know, but she'd probably like that kind of a thing. But she didn't tell you anything. Why? That comes from years of getting to know them. You with me? She knows I would rather have key lime pie or cinnamon rolls or ice cream and magic shell. That's manna from heaven. If she's going to cheat, it'll be with Cheetos. The food of the gods. She loves Cheetos. Do you understand? Do, do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to take the pressure off. Of Where people go wrong is, is they think they can obtain a relationship. Come to the book of Hebrews. Let me show it to you again here. Before we, I know we're in 1 Timothy 6, but come to Hebrews. Let me show you this. I've given this to you before, but it just bears repeating, especially for those of you that are new, because this is a new concept. Now, I'm not slamming people that are trying to do it a different way. I'm simply trying to get you to consider a different way. You don't need a road map for this. You don't need somebody to legislate to you what needs to be done if you learn how to listen to Him. 
he'll tell you to turn to the right hand or to turn to the left hand. What it does is it keeps your relationship with him fresh and it doesn't always feel like you're under a burden. Bondage always creates bitterness. I don't care what kind of bondage it is. I don't care if it is in a, uh, a silk-lined rubber room and you got platinum handcuffs on that are the most expensive in the world. It doesn't matter. You're still in bondage. And sooner or later, that bondage will create bitterness. The same thing happens in the Christian life. When people are trying to, quote, live right, do right, spit white, that means you don't chew chewing tobacco and all the other kind of things. When they're trying to do that, they say, well, here's what I'm doing. And they follow a checklist. I'm saying that that checklist, the work, does not develop a relationship. Amen. You have to learn, as the Bible's going to show you here in a second, you have to learn, first of all, how to worship. Amen. Then you have to learn how to walk. And then you learn about work. Work does not produce walk or worship. Do you understand? That's important for you to get because for years your church history shows that when you broke away from the Southern Baptist, one thing that you brought with you to the party was is you said, well, we're going to be independent, but what they did a little bit of in moderation, we're going to do on steroids. So you win them and then you wet them and then you work them and then they walk out the door. But that was what was taught for years and years and years was you got to get busy and you're never busy enough. And if you stay busy, then you guess what happens? You develop a relationship with the Lord and then guess what happens? You do all that stuff and you don't feel any closer to the Lord at all. You're like a leprechaun chasing a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You get to the end of the rainbow and it's like, where's the gold? You know, I've done all these things. I've ran buses. I've visited. I've knocked on doors. I've witnessed to a telephone pole. I sing in the choir. I teach a Sunday school class. I've gone to Bible school. I read my Bible every day. I pray every day. I tithe. I give over and above the tithe. I do all these things. And you get to the end of that and it's like, okay. And then they add one more thing and they add one more thing and then they add one more thing. And the next thing you know, it's like, oh, I don't feel any closer to the Lord at all. I felt closer to him when I wasn't doing all that because it was just me and him. So you got to understand that as I give you these passages about certain things that you should incorporate into your life as a Christian, at the root of those things, the vortex of those things, the center point of those things, the foundation of those things is a relationship with him. Look, when you first met your husband or you met your wife, you didn't immediately walk down the aisle and get married unless you were an idiot. You didn't run to Las Vegas and have somebody, you know, that's usually a carnal deal and all has to do with flesh. You know what you did? You sat down and you started talking first. And you decide if there was anything compatible. Right? And then over time, the relationship develops and then you get married and then the honeymoon's over and then you have to go back as you get older. You have to learn to... You talk, right? It's communication. Isn't that what marriage is? You know what marriage is? It's communication. It's not sex. Right. It's talking. It's communication. Boy, that went over really good. <laughs> Look, if you will, please, in the book of Hebrews. I hate to tell you this. Women like to talk more than men. Yeah, but you got to learn to talk back. You have to have communication. It's two ways. Look in Hebrews chapter number 11, pick it up, verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by being dead yet speaketh. Can I say that it's interesting that the order of things that are set up in Hebrews chapter number 11, that God who inspired the Bible saw fit to put Abel in there first. You say, why? Because he wanted to do the first thing is, is you have to learn to worship. First thing mentioned in the Bible is a guy that brings an offering of a, the more excellent sacrifice. You know what the problem with Cain was? Cain never had a relationship with the Lord. Why? Because Cain wanted to bring to the Lord what he wanted to bring, not what God wanted him to bring. Now here's the hard part. Cain would have had to go to Abel to get what God wanted. Because the purpose of the sacrifice wasn't just the lamb. The purpose of the sacrifice was he had a problem with his brother. And the Lord said, you want to please me, don't you? And Cain said, sure, I want to please you. He said, okay, bring a lamb. And Cain said, uh, that means there are only one shepherd in town. The Lord said, mm-hmm, yeah, that's, that's right. Go see him and bring me a lamb. Yeah, no, I ain't doing that. Don't you know sin lieth at the door? Yes, sir. 
I know that. I realize that. I'm not, you know what the Lord said? Okay. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be. Right? Now, even though he gets God's protection on him, he puts a mark on him and so on and so forth, he gets God's protection on him. He's out of fellowship with God. You follow his line and he winds up in serious trouble. Why? He didn't learn the principle of worship. He was working his head off. He grubbed the ground. He was producing fruit and vegetables, probably the best you've ever tasted in your entire life. But it wasn't what God wanted. What God wanted was the relationship that said, like Abraham said, when the Lord said, I want Isaac. It wasn't a matter of what does Abraham want to bring. It is a matter of what does God want you to bring. It's not the same for me as it is for Brother Larry. It's not the same thing. You say, why? I don't know what lamb he wants him to bring. And I don't know who he has to go to get it. And he doesn't know for me. But if you don't understand that principle, you'll never walk with the Lord. You say, why? Your communication's broken right off the bat. So I'm trying to get you to understand when I talk about the instruction of righteousness and when I'm talking about where we're fixing to go now about being perfect and truly furnished, that when I'm going to give you these verses, don't get this idea because the next one is on here that if I just work, it'll develop a relationship. You can work for a boss and never know the boss. You can be in a chain of command and never know the guy at the top of the chain. That doesn't work that way with the Lord. You can't work for everybody else in the chain of command. You and I are all individually yoked up to Him. And we all find our place in the body. In your body you have one brain. But in that thing are all the little connapses, the Ethernet cords and the little uh, 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 USB cords, all that other stuff is plugged into one brain. And one brain tells my finger to move and my eyes to blink. They're all wired to the right place. But there's one telling them what to do. If you're out of fellowship with that one, then the whole body doesn't know what it's supposed to do. And they have names for that medically. All right, look at the second thing in the book of Hebrews here. Is it making any sense? See, it's simplicity. It's keep it stupid simple. You say, no, it's keep it simple stupid. I don't want to offend you though. So if I just say if we make it stupid simple, if we make it easy to grab a hold of, we can all get it. Who can't have a relationship with the Lord? When the Bible said He created us for His pleasure and He created us to have fellowship with Him, if that's what we know is His will, who can't do that? Cain. But anybody else can if you want to. The issue becomes a matter of will. It becomes Gethsemane. It becomes, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, I don't know about you. I can't answer for you. I can tell you that it's probably true of human nature, but I run into that problem more than once a week. Lord, this is what I want to do, and this is how I want to handle it. And the Lord's like, well, I don't want it done that way. You know, the hardest thing to do is surrender my will for His. Not in big things. He's not willing that any should perish. Okay, Lord, I surrender. I'm going to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell but that all should come to repentance. I can do that one. No problem at all, right? But what on those little things? And the Lord said, I don't want you doing it that way. And you're like, Everybody, do you ever do this? Everybody else does it. <laughs> and the Lord said, not my will, but thine. How about you, David? Not your will, but mine. There comes that cross. That's the Apostle Paul. Paul said, I die daily. Paul's indicating to you that in the process of his ministry, as Christian as he was, as saved as he was, as in fellowship as he was, every day he was constantly having to battle his will against God's will. And he said, I die daily. I have to every day go to Gethsemane and say, not my will, but thine be done. He got himself jammed up over there. He's sitting at the feet of Gamil. And they told him, they said, don't go to, uh, over there to, back to uh, Jerusalem. And he said, I'm going anyway. I would that I were accursed that I might win them. And, and they said, don't go. If you're going to go. And the guy brings the leather girdle in there and tells him don't to go. And if you go, you're going to go in bondage and this and that and the other. And Paul goes. And he went against the Holy Spirit and he wound up paying for it. Because even for the Apostle Paul, the Lord didn't make allowances. Not my will, but thine be done. Now think about that. Wasn't Paul's reason for doing it a good cause? The Lord said, I'm done with the Jews. Leave them alone. But Lord, they're my people. And I love them and I care about them. And I, you know, that, that's my, my namesake and that's where I came from. And the Lord said, leave them alone. 
And then he has a preacher come and tell him. And he says, you can't listen to anybody else, Paul. Well, Lord, I'm, you know, well, you won't listen to me. Listen to the preacher. I'm not listening. The Lord said, okay. And he winds up paying for it. Paul got a beating he didn't have to get because he was disobedient. Look, if you will, please, in the next passage here. I hope this is making sense to you. Number five, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found, excuse me, because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he, what? You know what the Bible said? The Bible said in the book of Genesis that Enoch walked with God and he was not. I hear the preaching a lot of times. It makes good preaching. It makes a good illustration. The Lord said to him one day, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are to yours. Let's go on to my house. But it's more than that. It's much more than that. You know what's really going on there? Enoch, you're more like me than you are like Enoch anymore. So now, you know what you've done? You've lost your namesake. You've lost your recognition. You've lost your reputation. You look so much like me, I'm just going to take you onto the house. You're conformed to my image. Enoch walked with God. He ceased to exist. When you have that kind of a relationship with the Lord, it doesn't become about you. Listen to me. Your reputation, what anybody thinks or says about you, it becomes about, I'm like the Lord and so... What difference does it make what they say about you? You ever think about that? You ever think why it is that you're so offended that people talk about you? Can I just throw something at you just, just for consideration? It could be that you're right and those people are 100% wrong, but it could also be that you think too highly of yourself that nobody should be talking about you. How dare them talk about you? Well, why shouldn't they? Are you perfect? They talked about Jesus. I believe if I recall correctly. What are these wounds I received in the household of my friend? Is it possible that the Lord allows us every now and then to be reminded when somebody talks about us that we wouldn't be offended if we were dead? I've been to graves before, or caskets before, or coffins before, I've been all manner of things, and people come by, they say whatever they want to say. I've never seen a single dead person stir. How dare you? Who are you to show up at my funeral? I've, I've never seen that. They're, they just, they lay there like, They have that grin on their face like they know something you don't. <laughs> they do. They're in heaven. You can't bother them no more. <laughs> <clears throat> the joke's on you. But you ever think about it? Enoch walked with God and he was not. You don't think Enoch got talked about? You ever read Enoch's testimony? Enoch's testimony was the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. Yeah. Enoch's a preacher of judgment. You don't think people talk about him? Well, if you're doing right, don't worry about it. A friend of mine called me this week, a guy that I've known for a while, and he had some problems with the old preacher and this and that and the other, a, a guy that's uh, coming to his church and asking him some questions about it. And, uh, and, and I said, Brother, I, I hate to tell you this, and I'm sorry to say it, but I don't really have much time to talk to somebody who doesn't even know the man in the first place, but in the second place, the guy's dead. Why is he still hung up on that? Right. What difference does it make? We'll see when we get up there. You think we're going to get to heaven. I'm not coming here if he's going to be there. Okay. <laughs> really, I think there's some feel that strongly, you know. Well, you can't come to my church if you like that guy. Oh, okay. You're going to get to heaven and, oh, he's here? Can I go to the other place? <laughs> sure, going down. <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? You know, the second part of this thing is the two parts that have come to the most important thing. One is to worship. That's to sacrifice, offer what God wants. And then the second thing is to walk with Him. I like that song. We used to sing it at the nursing home all the time. I come to the garden alone where the dew is still in the roses and He walks with me and He talks with me and He tells me and all. I like that song. You say, why? It means a lot if He's walking with you. You can tell when somebody's walking with God. Moses goes up on the mountain, a part up there, and he goes up on the Horeb there, and he gets the uh, uh, t t commandments there from the Lord the second time around. And the Bible said when he come down, he wist not that his face shone. That means that when Moses came down there, he had been in the presence of the Lord so long that it changed his countenance. But the people knew about it. Moses didn't come down and say, look at my face, man. I've been looking in the mirror. Look at me. I've been with God. Moses wasn't even aware of it. He walked down there and then all of a sudden the people said, man, we can't even look at you. That must have been some kind of either he was really ugly or a bright light, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord said it was a bright light, put a veil across it just so they could talk to him. You ever been around somebody like that? 
You can just tell they've been with the Lord. The old preacher told a story one time. He said he was in, uh, up at Bob Jones University and he said he had heard that uh, uh, Billy Graham was coming over there to preach in the chapel service and all that. And he was going to go sit up in the bell tower because it was only for uh, certain people to be there. And so he wanted to hear the guy. And he said he ran into him. And when he ran into him, this was his story. It's not my story. This is his story. He said he ran into him and he said he felt like somebody had one of them big old huge fans behind him and that the, that the Spirit of God was just blowing off of him, that he could almost feel it, that the Spirit of God was on him so strong. I don't know if that's true or not, but the old man didn't have a way of, uh, of, of, you know, of uh, exaggerating. He pretty much told it like it was. He said there was something in those days when God's hand was on him. That's before California and before Puffin and before the press and before all the other stuff and all the ecumenical stuff and all that. That's back when they were still considered him to be an independent Baptist. But you know what he said about him? He said about him, he said, man, he said, when I ran into him, he said, the power of God coming off of him so strong, he said, you could feel it. They said Bob Jones Sr. was that way. They said Carl Lackey was that way. You ever been that way? You say, what's that come from? Walking with him, talking with him, spending time with him. You say, but, you're, but we, but we got to do all these things. Not until you get those two things. Not until you learn the fundamentals of surrender. That's worship. Not my will, but thine be done. And the second fundamental is, Lord, where would you like to go today? Not, Lord, this is what I'm doing today. Well, how about you? And the Lord's like, where would you like me to go today? What do you want me to do today? And then last of all, notice what you'll see down in the passage in verse number 7. Now you see by faith Noah being warned of God of the things not yet seen, moved with fear and, separate, and prepared an, uh, an ark to the saving of his house. Now, you got to grab a hold of that. Noah was in the last 120 years of his life when the Lord told him to build an ark. Do you think if he hadn't been worshiping and walking that God would have given him the blueprints for an ark? A lot of people miss that. That wasn't his first communication with Noah. He'd been talking with him a long time. And then all of a sudden, in a due time where the Lord said, okay, now's the time to do it, he tagged Noah and said, okay, apparently you worship, and apparently you walk, and so I'm going to give you some work to do. And that's an, a fruit of worship and walk, consummated, produces work. And when you do that, now I'm going to help you with something. When you do that, you won't be bitter that nobody else is in the hole digging with you. You ever get upset when you're doing something for the church and nobody's helping you? <laughs> Show up to visitation, nobody's there. Go street preaching, nobody's there. Have a special event, and nobody helps you. You ever think the Lord might design it that way just to see whether or not you'll do what He told you to do because you're doing it for the right reason? Noah didn't have any help. I saw parts of a stupid thing somebody put out. I don't remember the guy that was there. They had Cain getting on the ark and all kind of other stuff. But he had these rock people going around helping him gather timbers and stuff like that. Noah had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Mrs. Shem, Mrs. Ham, Mrs. Japheth, and Noah's wife. Nobody helped him turn a lick at a snake. You say, what does that mean? That means if you're going to do something for the Lord, it doesn't mean everybody's going to do it with you. But if you're doing it for the Lord, you're just glad to be doing it for the Lord. Boy, I sure got quiet right there. <laughs> you ever wonder why you get so upset? Maybe you're doing something God never told you to do. Otherwise, you'd be overwhelmed with the fact that you're being allowed to do it. I got the privilege of being called to preach. What does that mean? It's his calling. Do I judge my call to preach by how many people come? No, I judge it by the privilege to be able to preach. The congregation's up to him. Whether they come or don't come, am I pleasing him? I can't do it by pleasing people. You say, why? Well, could I just say with all due respect, you're sometimes a little fickled. And we're all governed by emotions. Is that a fair statement? Yep. And things change a little bit, right? So the only way I can help keep you on track is for me to stay in track with him and expect you all to understand that, which you do, and make sure that this is more important than this. Yep. Amen. Amen. 
That's been reversed nowadays, ladies and gentlemen. Nowadays, it becomes more about this than this. Well, you, I got, I can't, there's nothing I can do for you. I don't have enough brains to be able to help every one of you with all the stuff, but I know he does. So I preach and each one of you will hear something different. You say, well, how, how does that happen, preacher? That's him. That has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with oratory skills. It has nothing to do with preparation skills. It has nothing to do with anything other than him saying, you keep this line open and I'll take care of the sheep. He said, feed the sheep. Well, what am I going to feed you with? I don't have sheep food in my back pocket. It comes out of that book. There's the sheep food. So if I put sheep food in the trough, then you have to decide to turn up your nose at it and eat it or don't eat it. And maybe it'll help you. All right, Titus chapter 6. Is that making sense to you now? <clears throat> I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 6. I don't know. There's no, somebody like, well, Titus don't have six chapters. I'll, I'll just check in you. Just check in. You know, the hardest thing in the world is you're a pastor of a bunch of Bible believers that know the Bible as good as you do. <laughs> and you make a little misquote like that and immediately you, you see. <laughs> you know, don't forget I'm human. You know, I mess up every now and then. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Look, if you will, please, talking about the man. Verse number 11. Uh, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I come from, come to Psalms 119, I come from a paramilitary organization. I come from, at one point in time, being in part of or being uh, given the responsibility of rewriting the uh, FTO program, the field training officer program, for certain reasons. So it's easy for me to fall back on a rule and a regulation for everything. It'd be easy for me to just get up here and pick out the laws, the ordinances, and the statutes all through just even Psalms 119 and lay them down as your general orders and SOPs. That's what I did for 20 years. That's, I don't have any problem with that at all. And if you don't do them, then get written up. If you don't do it, fire you. No, that kind of thing. That's not the relationship with the Lord. The relationship with the Lord is those things are given to you as a pattern for you to be able to check and see how you're doing maintaining His standard. But you can't have that standard without Him. Or you become a Mormon or a Catholic or a Seventh-day Adventist or a Jehovah's Witness and you've done all those things on the outside without God. And now you're in a cult as opposed to having a relationship. That's the difference. A cult gives you certain things that you have to do. The Lord doesn't say, do these things. You know what He says? Have a relationship with me. Learn to worship. Learn to walk. I'll take care of conforming you. Can I say this to you? When the baby's born, uh, Leah, they just had the baby here. and uh, The baby's what? Uh, a week, two weeks, three, three weeks old now, two weeks old now. I'm like, why aren't they already in first grade? I mean, shouldn't they be learning ABCs by now? I mean, you know, let's teach them a history lesson and science lesson. You say, preacher, that's just absolutely ridiculous. You've got all these babies going around. Well, COVID's been good for one thing. The birth rate's gone up. <laughs> Don't you know you're supposed to keep social distancing? Anyway, <laughs> you've got all these babies coming along, Okay. Now listen to me, Christian. Please consider what I'm about to say. You don't expect out of a child adult behavior. They go to the nursery, then they go to their little Sunday school classes, and they come in here and they cry or they act up or they, you know, stick chewing gum on the pew or they do whatever it might be. And then over time, you gradually expect them to grow up and grow out of some of those things. Is that right? Why would you think that when a Christian, when a person is born again, that they would change any faster? Some of you have been saved 20 and 30 years and you haven't changed yet. And you're the ones that will be the hardest on, well, they're a Christian. They ought to be, well, well, hold on there. Pump the brakes. You don't know how old they are. It has nothing to do with physical age. It has to do with worship and walk. I'm not trying to be hard on you. I'm just saying pause a minute and think. You don't expect a kid that's in elementary school to be learning college level stuff. Why do you expect Christians to act over and above what their spiritual age is? We got teenagers here, a bunch of them. You say, what are they? They're teenagers. Well, they're saved. Yeah, they're saved teenagers. And they're as whacked out as you were when you were coming along. 
they have problems just like you did, probably even more of them. They're doing good to even be in church. Stop expecting them to act like you at 80. It don't happen like that. They make mistakes. You say, what do they do? They learn to repent of their mistakes, repent of their sins, and get back up and get on the horse. And if some of you had learned that at an earlier age, you might not have spent a lot of years banging around out there before you decided, I better get back to where I need to be. Amen. Amen. Church is never a place of unforgiveness, never a place of now that you've messed up, you've got the scarlet letter on you and that kind of... It's a place where you learn, I got to get back up and get back in. Well, let me just say this to you. Some of you got a little stiff on me there. I sure am grateful he's been that way with me. I sure am glad he said, okay, go on and preach. There have been times I've been down there in the pit with Jeremiah. Somebody says something pretty hurtful. I know you think I've got to hide like a rhinoceros and that kind of a deal, but sometimes it's so thin you could blow smoke through it. And somebody says something and I am just get a pity party and sit with Elijah under the juniper tree. It's enough, Lord, just kill me. I'm not doing nothing anyway, that kind of a thing. And you get over yourself and get over your self-pity and get over that kind of a deal. And I say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm not even worthy to preach. I'm down here in the PG. You send a guy down here. He bed me like with some cast iron clout, spray me off with a fire hose. And I, I'm, I, I, I denied you. I shouldn't have even done that. I'm not even worthy to be here. And the Lord said, okay, get up and preach. <laughs> you say, happened to you like that? Happened to Peter. See, you might not have denied Peter publicly like, I mean, denied Jesus like Peter did publicly, but I'm going to bet you every one of you denied him at some point in time. You don't have to deny him with words. Sometimes you just deny him in will. The Lord ever tell you to go to the altar and you didn't go? Hello, Peter. The Lord ever tell you to go make it right with somebody or to repent of the attitude you have towards somebody and you didn't do it? Hello, Peter. You're no different. You're betraying him. You're not allowing him to rule in your life. We're worrying about whether everybody else is doing it or not. What about you? In my life, you know what I find? I find that whenever I make people the subject of my mind, I find all of a sudden the Lord has a way of pointing things out to me and says, you know what? You're so interested in everybody else. I think I'm going to take a real interest in you. And my week of Bible prayer, Bible study and prayer will be uh, she all on wheels. I mean, it'll be unsheeted hell, boy. And the next thing you know, the Lord's like, you're still interested in looking at everybody else? Because all he does is just hold himself up there and say, yes. I'm reading the, the passage over there in Matthew 27, <clears throat> and I'm going through the passage, and I, I stumble on the thing where Pilate says, after he's been beaten, behold the man. And so I got stuck there in my Bible study this week. Behold the man. I'm like, Lord, I, I, I see who you are. Yeah, well, how come you're looking at everybody else? Behold the man. They talked about me. They laughed at me. They laughed me to scorn. They made me the enemy. I'm here to die for them. I created them. And you got a problem? Who's talking about you? Behold the man. You feel justified in feeling that way? Behold the man. Who when reviled, reviled not again. I mean, unsheeted. She old boy. And I'm thinking, okay, okay, Lord. Okay, all right. I've had enough. I've had a... Well, remember the lesson. I'm not interested in your opinion of everybody else. David. Behold the man. Yes, sir. Keep your eyes on him. It might keep you from wandering and looking at everybody else. I don't know about you, man. I got enough trouble keeping up in my own backyard than worry about what's in yours. Amen. Good preaching, preacher. It's just Sunday school. We just try to help you out a little bit. You know what? It make your relationship with the Lord so much better. Instead of you coming, as the deacon was telling me earlier, coming out of duty or responsibility, you come for a reason. I'm looking for Jesus. I like the passage in John where he said, you know, what are you looking for? Sir, we would see Jesus. <laughs> We're not here for all the other stuff. We want to see Jesus. What does Jesus say? How am I doing on time? Oh, about out. Well, I started a little bit late, so can you bear with me? Psalms 119. Look, if you will, please, let's pick it up and I'll oh, make it 97. Yeah, that's good. 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Better rerun that one. 
no matter how much he's in the book, the enemies never go away. Why would you think the Lord would banish your enemies? You learn a whole lot more from what your enemies think than you do your friends. Your friends are kind enough to you not to always tell you the truth. <laughs> are you married? Well, you're a liar then. You, you don't always give the absolute 100% dyed-in-the-wool, unsheeted truth, do you? You wear out your couch. <clears throat> For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients. Because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way. I might keep thy word. By the way, this is David writing this. Pretty, pretty profound. He's a man after God's own heart. I have not departed from thy judgments. For thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate what? Every false way. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now what he's saying there to you is, is that he gave you a, an instruction book. But that book is not going to do you any good if you don't have a relationship with the Lord because you'll think because you're keeping all of the things that you ought to be keeping according to how you interpret it and you'll pick the things that you know you can keep. You'll exclude the things you can't. Like in Ephesians 4. Right? Right? Let all wrath and anger and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice and be not bitter and forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake having, it starts off with grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You'll forget those. I don't smoke and drink and cuss at you. You ever wonder why preachers preach on smoking, drinking and cussing and dressing all the time? Because they don't want to deal with Ephesians 4. Envy and strife and division and slander and gossip. They don't want to deal with that. You say, what? That's what our Christian, that's our backyard. Our backyard's not high and tight, haircuts right. That ain't, that ain't ours. Ours is finding ways around to make it look like you're praying for somebody when all you're doing is spreading there because you don't like them. You know why you talk about the people you talk about? There's only one reason. You don't like them. You don't care if they breathe or don't breathe. Or you wouldn't put your mouth on them. Thank you, Brother Jerry. Everybody else kind of, well, you know, I, well, just the way I kind of feel and all that kind of You know what? Sometimes we spend so much time talking about other people as if God is interested in our opinion. <laughs> and the Lord looking down and thinking, you realize who you are talking to and what I know about you and that you would even walk into my court and tell me that about somebody else? Listen, ma'am, sir, he knew you when you were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, all those years you forgot before you got all sanctimonious and holy and perfect and pure and upright and, and faithful in your service to Jesus. He knew you, buddy, when you could have wound up walking the street with a needle in your arm. He knew you when you could have wound up a sop drunk sitting in a jail cell somewhere. Don't think just because you're here now that that means... You've always been there. No, no, he, he remembers that. What if somebody were to talk about you when you were doing that, the way you talk about folks now? I don't appreciate it. I'll tell you why. Because I like having people here. And I don't like it when you talk about it and keep them from coming. You say, why? I like cadavers to work on. I like to see them get brought back to life. I like to see him walking in here look like the stinking night of the living dead with eyeballs hanging out and flesh falling off of them and dragging their feet and their legs and arms all twisted up and stuff and just beat up by the world and shot out by the world and cut to pieces by the world and got leprosy and filth all over them and they're just sitting down and people just consider they're rotten, they're dead and watch God breathe in their, their nostrils the breath of life and they become a living soul and become a testimony for Jesus Christ. My goodness, man, I love to see that kind of stuff. You say, well, yeah, but it, no, you, you don't appreciate him like those people do. 
That old preacher had it right. That old preacher said a lot of you people got saved early, which I recommend. A lot of you got saved as kids, which I recommend. A lot of you been serving the Lord, which I recommend. But he said, we got an advantage over you. He said, those of us got saved late in life, he said, we appreciate our salvation more than you do. And we tend not to talk about others as much as you do. Because we know where we would be if it wasn't for Him. Do you ever think where you might could be? It don't take much of a look around. I don't say it lightly. When I see somebody like that, I say, but by the grace of God. I believe that. I believe that. Preacher, why didn't you do dope and why didn't you do this and that? Well, first of all, because the Lord allowed me to be a policeman early in life, which I think the reason he did it was to keep me out of that. I wish I could stand before you and tell you I've got all this upright moral character and I'm, you know, I've got this discipline in my life and this and that and the other. I honestly believe if the Lord had left me to myself and if it wasn't for praying mama and daddy, I honestly believe, man, I'd be a dope smoking fool and probably be already dead by now. I'd have probably joined the military and gone somewhere and gotten killed or something like that. But that would have, my life wouldn't have amounted to nothing. You say, why did the Lord do that? I don't know. There's something about that I'm afraid I would be addicted to. I'm afraid I'd like it. It would give me an excuse to do whatever devilment I wanted to do. That's the main reason why people take drugs and drink anyway. It just gives them an excuse to justify what they wanted to do in the first place. I'm scared of this stuff. You know, it's not that it's just the devil's, you know, juice and all this other kind. I'm scared of it. You say, why? It has an addictive power. I want to be addicted like that to Jesus. Amen. So we'll cover the rest of that stuff here this evening. I hope you'll come back for it this evening. I'm going to give you a, a different uh, service here this morning. But I hope you'll consider and pause that when we talk about this thing about being perfect, it's not this pharisaical attitude that you reach a pinnacle. It's this always striving to be better than you are. Now I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to close Sunday school. And it's not rhetorical and it's not intended to be. Is there something right now you could improve on? Well, until you get that fixed, then keep your eyes and your mouth off of everybody else. Yes, sir. Amen. I'll turn you loose when you get that fixed. And if there's not, then we're free game. Start with me. <laughs> You'll stay on me so long you won't have time for everybody else. Father, bless your word and thank you for it. Thank you for these folks being here today. Thank you for their testimony. Thank you for the encouragement that they are to me. Thank you for a building to come to. Thank you for the weather outside. Thank you for flushing toilets, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be able to continue to, to come in spite of all the stuff that's going on in the world today. I pray you'll be with us in the upcoming service. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.